everybody. Welcome back to our third and final talk today. Um, it's from Eldra Jackson the third. So Eldra is the co-executive director of Inside Circle, a writer and public speaker on the topics of at-risk youth advocacy, effective criminal justice, rehabilitation, and turning around toxic masculinity. Eldra brings clarity of purpose, mission, focus, and inspiration to his role at Inside Circle. He was an inmate at New Folsom Prison when he found Inside Circle and began the interpersonal journey that eventually led to his release in 2014 and his current leadership role. A living example of successful rehabilitation and re-entry, Eldra has dedicated his free time on the outside to serving at-risk youth and acting as a facilitator, trainer, and mentor. You can learn more about his work by going to www.insidecircle.org. So Eldra, whenever you're ready, uh, let's get going and best of luck. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, and, and, and thank you all for, for being here today and allowing me to share space with you. Uh, as Neil said, my name is Eldra Jackson III, and presently I serve as co-executive director of a nonprofit organization based in California that uh, has a mission statement of empowering system-impacted people to lead change from within. And as it stands today, the, the paradigm of system impacted people is generally thought of to be folks who are in prison, uh, in jails, on probation or parole. Uh, and that is because of where Inside Circle got its beginnings. Inside Circle was born on September 3rd. 1996. On September 3rd, 1996, at about 10.15 a.m., in a small town called Repressa, California, that is surrounded by a larger city that's known as Folsom, California, there is a prison that goes by the name CSP Sacramento, California State Prison, Sacramento also known as New Folsom. And about 10, 15 a.m. on September 3rd, 1996, a riot exploded on B facility. At the time, there were about 900 prisoners on the yard. And when this riot began, it began between what they call the Southern Hispanics or the Serenos and the black population. This riot was allowed to go on for about 45 minutes. Now, I don't know how many of you are listening and think that 45 minutes is not a long time, or you think about 45 minutes sitting in traffic, but 45 minutes of hand-to-hand -hand combat on a concrete yard, not knowing if you would live or die, not knowing if you would have to kill someone or someone would kill you because that's what was happening. People were actually uh, in, engaged in trying to kill one another. 45 minutes is an extremely long time. And it took 45 minutes for communication to go to the governor's office and give permission to stop the riot. And what that permission looked like was permission to begin firing live rounds from Mini-14 assault rifles. And at that time, they were using what are called NATO tumbler rounds. And what NATO tumbler rounds are designed to do is enter soft flesh and seek something solid to make contact with, and then it tumbles around in the body. A man lost his life as a result of being hit with a tumble around that day because he was hit in the ankle and the bullet came out of his neck, severed his carotid artery. He died instantly. <clears throat> 13 people were taken by helicopter. They call that life flight. 13 people were life flighted to local area hospitals to have their uh, uh, physical wounds tended to. Everyone else who was able to be triaged on site were handcuffed. They were taken back to their cells and their wounds were dealt with on site there. 
the lockdown lasted for almost a year following that riot. And at that time, there was a man who was on that yard and his, he, his name was Patrick Nolan. He was serving 25 to life for a murder. Patrick Nolan was uh, what they refer to as, as a white convict. And once upon a time, he was associated with the Aryan Brotherhood, a very uh, 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 politically motivated and racist, uh, anti-social group. Patrick had a lot of cachet. He had a lot of charisma and, and, and leadership capabilities. And by that time, Patrick had begun to do his own personal work. Patrick had begun to look at himself and begin to try and find his own meaning in works by folks like Viktor Frankl, reading books like Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, he had begun to study folks like Mahatma Gandhi and Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And he had come across uh, this movement that had begun about 40 years prior called the men's movement. So when the lockdown came up, Pat walked around the yard seeking to speak to all of the leaders of the various organizations on the yard. He went to the leaders of the Bloods, the Crips, the Aryan Brotherhood, the Black Guerrilla Family, the 415, the Nuestra Familia, and the Mexican Mafia. And he challenged all of the leaders of those different organizations to come to a group that he was attempting to put together. Now, Pat was a visionary, and I don't know that he had in mind exactly what it would look like, but he had grown sick and tired of being sick and tired of the senseless killing. He had grown sick and tired of individuals killing one another just because of the color of their skin. He had grown sick and tired of individuals killing each other just because of the part of the state that they happened to be born in. He had begun to grow sick and tired of people killing each other because the wind blew south today. And so he asked for permission from all of the leaders, if they were not willing to come, could people from your group attend without threat of retaliation? Because what Pat was attempting to do was bring individuals from all of these historically uh, uh, warring and adversarial factions together in one space at one time with an agreement that no one would kill each other while they were in that space together. This is the first time anything like this had ever been attempted in the state of California. And so all of the leaders agreed. Yeah, you can go ahead and do whatever it is you're trying to do, but if we hear anything funny, we'll kill you. And so Pat was able to get 13, that, that initial circle had 13 individuals in it, 13 people, representatives from all of the different organizations on the yard. And it started off as a one day poetry session. Pat was a poet and he had a lot of his poetry had been uh, published in different newspapers and, 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 and poetry scripts. And there was a man named Donald Morrison who was big into poetry and big in uh, what was known again at that time as the men's movement. And so Donald Morrison wanted to meet Patrick Nolan. He wanted to meet this great poet who was incarcerated, this beautiful, wonderful soul who was putting out these, these, these tremendous musings. And so Don reached out to Pat, they became pen pals and Don came in to visit and they put together a plan to put th this poetry session together. <laughs> and so Donald Morrison reached out to a man named Rob Albee, who had done time in the California prison system in the 60s and 70s, who was also a poet. So he came in to do a one day poetry session. And the way that Rob tells the story is that he knew absolutely nothing about teaching. And so he peeled each man off one at a time to ask them, what it is that they wanted to gain from this poetry session, from this group session. 
and he got to a, a, a prisoner named Manuel Ruiz. And at the time, Manuel was about 21 years old. He was serving life. And when Rob asked him what he wanted him to teach him, Manuel said, I want to learn how to feel again. I forgot how to feel. And so that was the beginning of what was known as men's group or inside circle. That was in 1997. Those programs have been going inside of Folsom since 1997. They've come to be affectionately known by people as healing circles <laughs> and the like. And uh, I was one of the individuals who sat in those circles. I served 24 years of a life sentence in the California prison system. At the time that I went in in 1990, if you had life, it didn't matter if it was life with the possibility of parole or life with the without the possibility of parole. If you went into the system with the life sentence, that meant that's where you were going to die. And so I went in at the age of 19 years old, believing that was the place that I would die and thoroughly resigned to that. By the time I was 19 years old, I had been such a danger and threat to myself and others that I was tried and convicted in the Sacramento County Superior Court by the Career Criminal Unit. I'm gonna say it again for the people in the back. By the time I was 19 years old, the Career Criminal Unit took up my case and sent me away for life. That's how dangerous I was viewed in the eyes of the system, and rightfully so. And so when I went in, I went in determined to become the best convict that I could be because this was my new life. This was my new career. This is who I would be for the remainder of my days. And for the first <clears throat> decade or so of my life inside, that's exactly what I did. I continued to engage in gang activity. I continued to engage in uh, moving weapons. I continued to engage in the drug trade and all manner of, of rules violations. I continued to assault and attempt to kill other human beings. You, 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 if whatever you can think about, I was in, engaged in it. I went to the SHU, the Security Housing Unit, Administrative Segregation, the whole. And, and I was sentenced to 20 months for attempting to kill another prisoner. And when I got out of the SHU, I was sent to New Folsom. This was in 2000. By that time, the circles had been up and running for a couple of years. And it had the uh, uh, reputation around the yard as a uh, hug a thug. Folks used to refer to it as hug a thug. Nobody who wasn't in the circle knew what was going on in there. They just had beliefs and ideations about what it was. What what are these dudes going in here? Is it a cult? They're they're praying the candles, uh, the hugs in there, singing kumbaya. No one knew what was going on, and neither did I. A couple of years after I arrived at New Folsom, I was invited to join because that's the only way that you're able to join those circles on the inside is by invitation. You're sponsored in by someone. I turned it down a couple of times and, and, and finally I got to a point where my curiosity overwhelmed me and I stepped inside the circle. And I immediately knew that I was home. I knew my soul was home. The things that I saw and the things that I was exposed to and the way in which I was challenged in a healthy way by people that I respected, by peers, was something that was unheard of. It was unheard of in prison, but in my experience, it was something that's unheard of in society today. In the description of, of this session, there was a term used, toxic masculinity. 
that's a real hot button issue these days. You, uh, uh, in my experience, you know, uh, the word, the terminology toxic masculinity is put out and ink, 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 alarms go off, red flags, warning, 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 danger, Will Robinson, warning. It is viewed as, or can be viewed as an assault on manhood. It is something that is uh, a, a, a movement and or a design to uh, emasculate men, to emasculate manhood, to do away with masculinity, to make being a male or a man uh, a crime against humanity. There are a lot of negative connotations that are attached to that. And anything can be toxic. Too much of anything can be toxic. People have died from ch challenges drinking water and in ingesting too much water in too brief a period of time. Water can be toxic. Air can be toxic. So for me, and I'll speak for myself, when I speak about toxic masculinity or if I engage in, in that conversation, I am coming from a place of too much of a good thing being detrimental to someone else. I live in a world, we live in a world where because I was born male, I've never in my life walked across a parking lot, a dark parking lot in the evening, headed to my car and wondered about the panel van that was sitting over in the dark corner and thought, there's a creeper in there who's going to kidnap me and rape and kill me. That thought has never crossed my mind. But half our population, real or imagined, has to consider things like that. I've never gone to a party and been afraid to leave my drink unattended so that I can go to the bathroom. I grew up in a culture where sports was a big thing. I was an athlete. I played football, I played baseball and there is a culture, there is a mentality that goes along with, tr with training young people to be winners, to be competitors. There are some good there, and there are some things that, that are overboard, that can be overboard. So when, when, when I speak about toxic masculinity, when, when, when I engage in those sorts of conversations, those are the sorts of things that I am talking about. So I'll take it back to prison. Prison is one of the most toxic places on the face of the planet. It can be. And it can be a hyper, extremely hyper masculine environment. So taking the conversation back to those circles, you have individuals who are habitual enemies who are habitual foes in an environment where everything is compressed, where everything is concentrated, including the masculinity aspects. Everything is a challenge. If you look at me too long, that means something. You're challenging me. So I have to address that. If you disrespect me, I have to respond because if I don't respond, everybody's watching and if I fail to respond in a uh, acceptable way, and that acceptable way is usually in a violent manner, then that means I'm weak. And now I'm open to be preyed upon by the other sharks in the sea. That is a toxic way of thinking. That's a toxic way of being. That's a toxic way of existing. And so what was able to occur in those circles is that we were able to begin to look at those things. We were able to begin to support one another in those things and figure out, does this work for me? Does this way of being work for me? Does this way of thinking work for me? For the 10 years that I was on the yard in New Folsom, and this is a maximum security prison, there was not one racial, racial riot. There was not one incident across 
racial lines. Because the individuals in that circle were healing. The individuals in that circle were beginning to find, tap into, and live from the purpose of their own humanity. That's what I was beginning to do. Some folks look at what we do and how we do it, and it's been labeled group therapy. It's been labeled a, a host of other things, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Uh, there are elements of CPT. There are elements of CBT. And what it boils down to for me in layman's terms is people having the courage to sit with other people where they hurt. People having the courage to sit with other people in their pain. People having the courage to sit with other people in their joy, in their shame, in their fear, in their anger. People willing to witness other people and be witnessed by other people. It's a lost art in our society, sadly. And so what we do in these circles is provide a space for individuals to heal. I can't speak about the healing of other individuals. I can speak about my own personal healing. I'm not somebody when you hear about, you know, I was a, a career criminal. I did, you know, several stints in juvenile facilities. And then at the age of 19, committed, committed a, a string of atrocious, uh, atrocious crimes that had me sentenced to life in prison. Uh, oftentimes people think, oh, well, he probably came from the wrong side of the tracks. Uh, his, his mother was probably on crack. His father was probably absent from the home and, uh, you know, a host of other things, you know, poverty, all of the things that, you know, as a society, we like to think uh, are, are reasons for people to engage in crime. Symptoms that uh, uh, contribute to folks engaging in crime. I had two parents in the household, my mother and my father. They're both still alive. They just celebrated their 54th wedding anniversary this past August. I had a very stable household. My father was a military veteran. He served in the Vietnam War and he earned a Purple Heart. He was present and has been present my entire life. I was also a victim of uh, sexual trauma at the age of seven, eight, and nine years old by uh, people who were charged with taking care of me, babysitters. And that trauma inside of the mind of a seven-year-old contributed to a story, contributed to internal self-talk about who I was about who others were, about what power was, and about what strength was. And that seven-year-old began to determine who he was and who others were. I was able to play those stories out and that self-talk out on the sports field. That was a place where I could be very aggressive and it was encouraged and it was applauded. It was rewarded. But nobody knew what was going on behind the mask because there was a mask there because I didn't want you to see who I was. I didn't want you to know who I was. I didn't want you to know that I was just a scared little boy who didn't know who he was, that I was a scared little boy who had no understanding about the things that had happened to him and didn't know how to articulate it, didn't know how to communicate it, didn't know how to say it. As a child growing up in the 70s in a, a, a excuse me, in, a, in an African-American home, talking about things that go on outside of the house was a no-no. Embarrassing things uh, uh, being spoken was against the rules, was against the regulations, was against the guidelines. That's toxic thinking. That's toxic behavior. 
my parents didn't know about the things that I'm sharing with you now until I was 35 years old and we were sitting in a visiting room and I had begun to do this work with Inside Circle and I was able to articulate to them the things that had occurred with me. So as I said, I was able to uh, play these things out on the sports field until I was no longer able to play them out on the sports field. A friend and I stole his mom's car, took it for a joyride and, and totaled her vehicle. And so I was put on punishment that summer, which meant no baseball for me. Sports was how I gained a measure of respect. Sports was how I was able to exert power and be seen as a powerful individual. When that was taken away, that little boy began to look for other ways to gain a measure of respect, to exert power, to seem powerful, to find another mask to hide behind. And so the mask that I chose to pick up was one of a gang member. I played ball with a lot of folks who were in gangs and who sold drugs. And so for me, the transition seemed natural. These were folks that I was already uh, in relationship with. These were folks that I already knew. And with my father having a military background and me being raised in that household, adhering to rules and regulations and guidelines was very natural for me. It was something that I had been born into. And so having the opportunity to be in and exert power over others and to not be a victim and to be in position to victimize others was very attractive to me. This is not an excuse for criminal behavior. What this is are other elements that contributed to the decisions and the choices to engage in criminal behavior. And it wasn't until I began to sit in those circles and engage with that trauma and go back in time and not just relive the trauma, but develop a healthy relationship and understanding with the trauma and then come back to present date with new and healthy determinations about myself and who I was and who I wanted to be. Not until then could I begin to be a healthy and whole human being. And that's what we do in those circles. That's what we do in Inside Circle. And that is not just a prison thing. That's a human being thing. As I stated, when I went into prison with a life sentence, that's exactly what that meant. Life meant life. Over the course of decades, times change, politics change, uh, money changes, and the need for revenue changes. Court systems got involved, and life with possibility meant that mm, one day you might be able to get out. And so in 2014, 24 years after I walked inside, I walked out June 18th, 2014. Not only did I walk out, but several of us who were in those circles began to walk out. And our elders who had been holding the space and coming inside faithfully over the course of that 25 years turned the leadership of the organization over to us. The men who came inside and initiated us across the threshold into manhood, into health, then gave us a new challenge. Take this work, grow this work, spread this work. And so today what we do at Inside Circle is, of course, we continue to go inside of prisons and support that work in. Inside Circle. This work started in one prison in Folsom. We are now in Folsom. We are in the California Medical Facility at Vacaville. We are in the California State Prison at Solano. We are in Jamestown Prison and we are working on getting into San Quentin. 
across the country, we are in the Juvenile Justice Commission in New Jersey in cooperation with the Annie Casey Foundation. We began in 2019 going into the Juvenile Justice Commission sitting with youngsters who have been tried and convicted, some as young as 12 years old. And we began sitting in circle with them. In February of 2020, there was something that hit the world called a pandemic, COVID, COVID-19 hit. And uh, we weren't able to go inside anymore. But the system didn't stop. So what they decided to begin doing was create COVID credits and they started releasing those young men in the midst of a pandemic. Now they're 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. They've been incarcerated since they were 12, 13, 14 years old, and they're being released into a global pandemic where so-called healthy, well-functioning human beings are at their wits end and don't know what to do, don't know how to function, and don't know what tomorrow looks like. And now these folks are being released into this and being told, okay, assimilate get out here and succeed. So what we did was create a program called YAY, Young Adult Empowerment, so that we can keep those individuals in, engaged and uh, have team members from around the country be able to support them. And so we started meeting with them two times a week on Zoom and compensate them for their time because their time is precious, their time is valuable, and their lives mean something. And so what we did with Ye and continue to do today with Ye is focus on life skills, soft skills that many of us might take for granted. Work readiness, financial literacy. These young folks know absolutely nothing about a credit score and the need to protect your identity. They know they have no idea about what goes inside of a wallet, what you carry and what you don't carry. So we developed a program to support that and to support them in that. More importantly, we developed a program to address the addiction to the lifestyle. And because often, oftentimes when folks think about addiction, they think about drugs, they think about alcohol, they think about porn, they think about gambling, but the criminal lifestyle is very addictive. The adrenaline rush that comes with that is extremely addictive the pull of the streets, the pull of the homeboys, the pull of the rush of the art of the deal can be very addictive and destructive. So we have to focus on that. We have to support them in that. And to date, we have had 47 individuals who have gone through that program on the inside, return back to the community. And those who choose to remain engaged, of those who choose to remain engaged in the YAY program, Five have had what we call negative contact with law enforcement. And we classify negative contact with law enforcement to be anything from a traffic violation to an arrest. Five individuals have had negative contact with law enforcement, and two of those five individuals are facing serious charges. The other 47. They're thriving. They've got jobs. They're beginning families now. They're going to school. They're not going back to prison. They're not hurting other people. And more importantly, they're not dying. The recidivism rate for individuals in the adult system in California who've gone through Folsom Prison over since 1997, 503 individuals have been through the program. Of those 593 individuals, 191 have parole. Of those 191, I'm gonna throw this number five out again. It seems to be our magical number. Of those 191, five have had negative contact with law enforcement and not one has gone back on new charges. The recidivism rate 
for California is over 76%. The national average is over 70%. The individuals who participate in this program is less than a percentage point. We don't go back. There's a phrase that we use, hurt people hurt people. And healed people heal people. What we seek to do in the world and what this work can and does do in the world is support spaces for hurt people to begin to heal. We do this work now in the world with not just folks who are involved in the criminal justice system. We do this work in the community. We do integrated circles for all humans. It doesn't matter what you identify as, man, woman, whatever. We do these integrated circles so that everyone can sit together and do this work. We do this work in corporate environments. We do this work with C-suite executives. We do this work with wardens. We do this work with sheriff's departments. We do this work with judges. We do this work with district attorneys. This is people work. We do this work with young folks who are not involved in the system. We do this work with human beings. This is life-saving work. This is a lifestyle for me. I do this work because this work saved my life. This is not work for me. This is a lifestyle for me. This is, this, is, this is why I was put on the face of this planet. Oftentimes, people are not blessed to be able to know what their meaning is. I know what my life's meaning is. I know why I was put on the face of this planet. I know what I'm supposed to do. I surrendered to that long ago inside prison when I became free. I was free in prison long before they ever opened the doors and unloosed the shackles. I became free in prison in heart, in soul, and in my emotions. What I learned and what we attempt to support folks in, in gaining in these circles, in these spaces, is emotional literacy. When we talk about toxic masculinity, or when I talk about toxic masculinity, I grew up in an environment, and I still see it today, where men are not encouraged to express the full range of emotions. Anger is something that's acceptable. It projects strength, strength, it projects power, it provides the necessary energy to defend. Every now and again, happiness is, is encouraged and it's celebrated, but don't do too much of it because you might start to dip off into some sadness and some tears begin to come up. And that can be viewed as weak in some circles, but men are not uh, historically uh, encouraged and supported around a full range of expression when it comes to emotional literacy. And on the flip side of that, women are not often uh, encouraged to express their full range of emotions. Anger is not something that traditionally we view as attractive in women or, 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 or feminine in women. Rage is not something that we encourage women to really investigate on a deep level. We have names, we have derogatory names that we use for women who, who show up in that way. And so what I learned in those circles and we continue to support people within those circles is to begin to investigate my full range of emotions, to be with not just my anger, but what's underneath my anger. Because oftentimes when I would say that I was angry, I wouldn't even say that I was angry. I'd say I'd been disrespected. And disrespect is a state of judgment is a state of projection around something that somebody did or did not do. It's not an emotion. Anger is an emotion. And oftentimes for me, when I was angry because I had been disrespected, what I didn't have the capability to articulate was that my feelings had been hurt. 
or that I was afraid. What I'm able to speak to these days is my fear. What I'm able to speak to these days is my shame. What I'm able to speak to these days is my joy, is my sadness. I'm able to be with those emotions in a healthy way. I'm able to be in those emotions and not allow those emotions to be the driving and determining factor behind my actions. That is unhealthy. That can be toxic. And so what we seek to do with this work is support individuals in that, in the ability to be with their emotions, in the ability to not just be with their emotions, but to be with the emotions of other human beings. It's impossible for me to authentically be with another human being, and I don't have the capability to be with myself if I haven't taken the time to be with myself because I don't know how to be with you if I don't know how to be with myself. I can't begin to be with you and truly listen to you and honor and respect the light that is in you if I don't know how to do that with myself. And for many moons, I didn't know how to do that with myself. And people that we sit with in these circles, and I don't care if you have a billion dollars in the bank or you're sitting on death row, I sit with everybody on both ends of the spectrums and all the way across that spectrum. Oftentimes people don't know how to just be with themselves in order to be with other people. It takes a lot to be with other people. It takes a lot to hear other people and to sit with other people's pain. And, and, and for me to sit with your pain, I have to be able to sit with my pain. It's incumbent that I know what my pain is, where my pain is, and, and be able to sit with that. And not everybody has a horror story about being abused, about being uh, uh, brutalized or, or something along those lines. Sometimes the trauma, trauma can be not being seen, not being heard. How many people do we know and how many of us have been in positions where we have not felt seen and we have not felt heard? And that is translated into our sense of value and self. If I'm carrying a, a, a diminished sense of self value, how do I show up in the world? Or better yet, how do I not show up in the world? What is the world missing if I am not showing up as my best as my best self? What is the world being robbed of if I am coming coming from a diminished sense of capacity? If I'm coming from less than who I can be, less than the best that I can be of service to myself and to others, what is the world missing? if that's the case. I know that I need my best sense of self and I know that I need your best sense of self. That is what makes for a better world. It's not laws, it's not regulations, it's not politicians, it's not red versus blue, it's not uh, uh, the Irish versus the, the whatever, it's not the Catholic versus the Protestants, it's not any of that. What can and will and does heal the world is people seeing people, people being with people, people honoring people. We were able as I mentioned, in the depths of the belly of the beast to stop killing each other, to stop aggressing across racial lines, to stop aggressing across established gang lines, to begin to see one another, to begin to care about each other's mothers and sisters and brothers to begin to feed one another. Physically, emotionally, and spiritually feed one another and support one another. 
society's throwaways. We were able to do that. We were able to find ways to cobble that together without any structure and without any guidance from the system. If we can do that in those spaces, what's possible in the larger world if we begin to truly see one another? Think about that. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your space. And now I, I suppose we'll open it up for a Q&A. Okay, Eldra, that was an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you so much for just for sharing that. And I suppose just for being so raw and so vulnerable. Um, it was powerful. So thank you. Um, so just sort of touching on that last point, point that you me you mentioned, you know, um, if, if it could have this kind of effect within prisons and with people that are, you know, at the maybe at the lowest points in society and you're saying you know what would the world look like if this was something that was commonplace in all of our different uh structures and systems and organizations um how do you envision that actually looking you know what would that look like on a societal level if these sort of circles were common practice in our in our organizations in and in our culture what would that look like hmm what it would look like and what it does look like in the places that we are able to take this in is community healthy communities what we developed and what we put together in 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 prison was a healthy community when we take this into workplaces and we bring this out in the community what we get is people beginning to see people i go into organizations where folks have been working side by side in their cubicles for 20 years and don't know each other. And they have thoughts and judgments and projections. Oh, well, when Brenda shows up, she's got a sourpuss look on her face. You know, she must be a bee. You know, this must be what it is because they've never talked. And then we get them to sit down and converse with one another. And as it turns out, Brenda is working eight hours a day. And when she goes home, she takes care of her mother who's suffering from dementia. And she's taking care of her six-year-old child. And the person who's sitting in the cubicle next to her also has a parent or a family member who's suffering from dementia. Now they see each other. Now Brenda's not a sourpuss. I understand where Brenda's coming from because Brenda is me. But we've been sitting next to each other for 20 years and don't even know it. That makes a huge difference. That is community. Now we can begin to support one another because we see each other. I don't just see you as the other, I see you as a part of me. What can happen is we stop othering people and we begin brothering and sistering people. 100%. It seems that what this does um, is it gets, we're all walking around and we're looking at each other as if we're wearing masks, but what this does is it gets behind the mask and we start to get a glimpse into the internal world of people. And then whatever we can do that, we can start acting with empathy and compassion. And it's, we live in a different world entirely. Um, so Elder, what about, you know, if we are, we, not, what, what are the actual dynamics? What's the format of a circle? Like, how does it actually work, you know, in, in practice? What sort of, what are the practices? How does it, how does it look whenever you're setting one up? Mm. What it looks like is we have six agreements. Anonymity, what's said here remains here. What you share belongs to you and only you can go out and share your experience. You can share your experience. You can't share anyone else's experience or what they said. Speak from the I perspective so that I can own my experience. That is a part of that growth. That is a part of that healing. You have the right to pass. You don't have to engage in anything that you don't want to engage in. Do not show up drunk or high. If you do show up drunk or high and you just need to be there, we ask that you communicate with somebody that you are in an altered state so that we can keep you safe and we can keep the group safe. No violence. You don't put your hands up. And that was a big prison thing, the no violence piece. And out here, it's evolved in you don't touch people without permission. Don't put your hands on anybody without permission. Mm. You mentioned, Elder, about uh, 
you experienced some quite severe trauma as a, as a child. Um, yes, sir. And I, I, so I'm curious to ask, was your first experience of opening up about that, your first time disclosing it in, in the circles? And also, what was your subjective experience of day-to-day life like after you had done that, could you can you think of a before and after what that was like for you actually after you'd actually opened up and processed this this really intense trauma that you'd been through? Mm. Yes, the first time that I uh, gave voice to it and 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 spoke about it and began to look at it was in a circle in prison, being held by other men in that space, and and what it looked like for me before and after was that I was able to begin to uh, identify my uh, a disconnect from people and my guardedness from people and not let, wanting to let folks in. And again, you know, my uh, 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 notions about power, my notions about being a victim, why I was so quick to snap if I felt like I was being attacked, why I was so able to rationalize, you know, uh, hurting other people to keep me safe. As irrational as that seems, if I'm hurting someone or if I'm engaged in the act of hurting people, it's not possible for me to be hurt. There are all sorts of constructs that were bouncing around in my psyche that I was able to then get in touch with and identify and recognize, oh, shit, this is what this is tied to. And then start to reconstruct that and look at when those things pop up, when those things are triggered inside of me, be like, whoa, I can understand where that uh, a survival mechanism was born in that instant, in that moment, so that I could make it to the next moment. But that's not appropriate in the here and in the now. Without that understanding, without that realization and being able to come from that place. I was just a, a, a human hand grenade in society. Okay. Well, a big part of this you mentioned is developing emotional literacy and mm-hmm. having some separation from your emotions and not being controlled by your emotions. How do you recommend people can best do that? How can they sort of, I, I don't know what the word I'm looking for. How can they own their emotions so that their emotions don't own them? Mm-hmm. The, the best thing that I have found and, and what I would invite folks to do is be willing to sit with the emotions. Oftentimes emotions come up that I might uh, classify as negative and I don't want to feel that. I don't want to feel sadness. I don't want to feel shame. Be willing to sit with that shame. Be willing to sit with that sadness in the same way that I'm willing to sit with joy in the same way that I'm willing to sit with anger and don't judge the emotions because emotions are a natural part of the human experience. It's not the emotions that are bad or are ill. It's what I choose to do as a result of the emotions that can be harmful. The emotions are not the harmful piece. It's what I do with those emotions. So be willing to sit with those emotions and then question, where is this coming from? And How does this serve me? How do I want to be with this? Oftentimes people don't ask themselves those simple questions. And and they become reactionary as opposed to responsive. Next question here is from Esther Cole. Um, She says, deeply moving. Thank you for inviting us to explore the inner workings of the circles with us. I think you said less than 1% of people in prison attend these groups. How can we encourage more people to attend these groups in prison? Hmm. That's a, that's a very good question that we're that we're still trying to figure out. And and it's 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 there. I have to want it. I can't make someone change. We can't make people change. Some of the things that I share with you here today, you can't make people go into their trauma. You can't make people. I have to be ready for that when I'm ready for it, when I'm ready for change, when I'm ready for transformation, when I've reached a point in my life where I recognize that I don't have all of the answers. When I got to the point where I recognized that I was my own worst enemy and I was the, 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 the causative factor for all of the bad things that were happening in my life. It wasn't the system. It wasn't the man. It wasn't because I'm black. It wasn't because they're trying to keep me down. It was because of the bullshit that was going on inside of me. 
and how I was making choices to move in the world until someone is ready to understand and recognize that their own worst enemy and their biggest impediment is themselves. Yeah, they, there are other real things out there. Is there really racism out there? Yes. Are there really systems out there that are designed to uh, 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 benefit some people and not benefit other people's? Yes, those are very real things. I'm not, I don't, please don't take it that I'm trying to minimize any of that. And where is my self-agency? Where is my power inside of that? What do I have dominion over? Because those are things that are external that I have absolutely no control over. What I do have control over is myself. What I do have control over is how I am going to move through the world. So that is my focus. And that changes things. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. So next question here from Roger Dennison. Um, thank you for an amazing presentation. What more could fathers and mothers do to help see and, and, under, and understand their children so they are less likely to have negative contact with the criminal justice system? Recognize that, 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 that children are human beings. <laughs> they're, they're just little miniature humans. Yeah, it's, uh, what, what I see so often is, and, and, and I'm not trying to pass out parenting advice. I am a parent, but I'm, I'm learning. There's no book. There's no manual. What I'm learning is to, to be with my children and to, to, to meet them where they're at and to listen to what it is that they're saying and encourage them to speak more about what it is that they're feeling. I get down and, and have my six-year-old walk me through what, not just why he did what he did, but what he's feeling in the moment that he's doing what it is that he's doing. And then we walk through, well, how does this impact you? And how does this affect your mother? How does this affect me? How does this affect your brother? What's the impact here? And we work through those things and he comes up with the answers. And we solve things together. We build community. Very cool, very cool. So there's less of like a hierarchical relationship. It's more like you're on, on the same level with the uh, with the children. Um, some things, there are some, there are some places <laughs> where there's just got to be a very hard line, but within that, I want to give him the space to grow and to learn and to know that he has a uh, 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 exploratory, you know, uh, 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 dominion over himself to be with what he is, to understand what he feels and investigate that and not feel stymied in it and not, well, I'm the parent and this is what it is because I said, so when you're 18, then you can do what you want to do. Well, by that time, they're all screwed up. Um, just one more question before we finish up. Um, so I discovered your work through the documentary, The Work, mm -hmm. um, which mm -hmm. is incredible, by the way. Um, anybody that's watching this talk, I think you'll absolutely love it if you haven't already seen it. Um, we have a question here from Sam Pierre. He, Sam Pierre, I think that's, I'm pronouncing that right. Um, he said, you know, I know you've got a podcast, which is a great resource. Um, what's your, what's your podcast called, by the way? The Inside Circle Podcast. Inside Circle Podcast. Okay. Um, but is there a, have you got a book in the making where people can learn more about the work um, or something that can be recommended to any clients coming into therapy? So Sam and many of our audience are working, they're mental health professionals. So they're just wondering mm -hmm. anything you could recommend in that regard. Certainly. I, I would recommend uh, the documentary the work and the Folsom prison day book and the Folsom prison day book is a collection of poems and writings by uh, individuals who sat in those circles inside. Some of them still sit in those circles inside uh, expressing themselves through the art of poetry. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Well, Eldra, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with us. Um, that was a really powerful presentation and I just want to wish you the very best in all the work that you're doing and on, on your mission. So um, yeah, best of luck, sir. It's been an absolute pleasure and uh, we'll talk to you soon.